Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to this week's episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. And I'm not Adam, your co-host. I'm Shannon. <laughs> This week we have Shannon, who is going to be guest hosting with me. If you remember Shannon Fritz from the Stop Domain Joining Your PCs. He's one of our experts in device management, um, fellow Microsoft uh, co-worker. Mm -hmm. Um, And he's going to be sitting in for Adam this week. Yeah, and I just got over the flu, so my voice is amazing right now. It's real nice and deep, so... I mean, just to hear what it sounds like on the recording. <laughs> Got that radio quality to it. Yeah, we'll see how it plays out. So we have a few stories to talk about this week, um, starting with Patch Tuesday. Uh, mm-hmm. There's a big one. We had talked about some of the flaws that were getting fixed, but there were 68 total. Um, 11 out of the 68 were critical. Six of them are actively exploited zero days. So very concerning. Um, We had also mentioned one of the things that was getting fixed was the outdated drivers list for Windows, the vulnerable drivers list. Um, So, uh, yeah, just just the breakdown of some of the numbers, 27 elevation of privileges, vulnerabilities, four of them are security feature bypass, 16 remote code execution, 11 information disclosures, six denial of service, and three spoofing vulnerabilities. So pretty extensive list. I would um, highly recommend to get working on those patches and test them, deploy them, get them patched as soon as possible. Yep. It's a big list. The second story that I have is the Medibank Breach and Medibank is one of Australia's largest private health insurers, and they suffered a ransomware attack. Now, Adam and, Adam and I did pre-record an episode on Microsoft's defense digital defense report, and we're going to release that next week. But in that, we talked about how ransomware as a service is rising, and one of the tactics that Microsoft noted in the report was. This double extortion is on the rise. And this is really an example, a very, very recent example of this double extortion tactic where Medibank first detected some unusual activity in their network about a month ago. And then on October 20th, they released a statement saying, we believe there's only a limited chance that paying a ransom would ensure the return of our customers' data and prevent it from being published. So basically they, they said, we're not going to pay. The yeah. initial ransom was set at $10 million, which is about 15 million Australian dollars. So that was October 20th. And then this Wednesday, Revol, who you, you listeners of the show may be familiar with, they're a Russian ransomware as a service group, started publishing the stolen records on the dark web, which included customer names, Uh, birth dates, passport numbers, and information on medical claims. And what I found was most concerning and probably more cruel than anything is that they separated samples of the breach victims into a naughty and good list. And the naughty list included numerical diagnostic codes that appeared to link victims to drug addiction, alcohol abuse, and HIV, and they even claimed that they had a CSE file of patients who have gotten abortions. It's interesting so, to think that the people who've stolen those records and tried to do this extortion and then decide that they're going to make this like line in the sand on the good and the bad of the data they're going to leak. Like, come on, that's, that's insulting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, I just think this is just really cruel in general, right? To, um, so now you're victimizing people who have, you know, who were patients of this health insurer. So, um, and they're having to pay the price of, of the poor security. So 
Um, yeah, and, and Medibank did set up some resources for the victims. Um, but, you know, to me, it's a too little, too late. Um, it kind of always is that way, isn't it? Like, it's, you can only do so much, and you never really can make it whole again. But at least there's some effort there to make amends in, a, in some way. Yeah, it's pretty pretty standard stuff, like providing um, identity monitoring because a lot of their personal information could lead to to. identity theft. Um, And uh, they they did state, though, which I I thought was, I guess, unique, is any customers in a uniquely vulnerable position as a result of the cybercrime will be given financial uh, support. So Hmm. I don't know what that unique vulnerable position is. And I wonder but, if that's kind of a case by case basis where they reach out and say, Hey, this happened to me and then they figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. And then um I thought this was at least good. All customers are gonna get access to free mental health support. So, you know, if you if you're suffering from anxiety or some other mental health issue, they're they're gonna provide you with that support. Um And that's well, a pretty tough thing to go for. I mean, like I I know um, just trying to get engaged with uh, professionals for any kind of support, especially when you're like just confessing the fact that you need some kind of help is a huge step and people should be totally proud of being able to do that. So if you've got this resource available to you and you're thinking about taking it, just do it. Yep. So I really just wanted to put this in here because it's just another recent example of this whole double extortion. And so the the onus becomes more and more on data protection and having that information protection, which is usually farther down the list of priorities um, for most companies. As um, Adam and I will talk about that in our show next week, uh, where we kind of talk about how um, many of Microsoft's responses to ransomware and cybersecurity incidents over this last year Many of the customers did not have a data loss protection solution in place. Mm. And, and, you know, like I said, that's usually farther down. There's something else takes precedent. And, um, but with these double extortions, that's something definitely to think about. Yeah. Okay. So our main story tonight and really why I wanted to record, um, this show and thanks for Shannon for stepping in. Um, is I wanted to talk about Twitter and <laughs> this, this whole Twitter meltdown that we've been seeing before our eyes. Yeah, playing um, out live and living color. It's like watching the Titanic, like going towards the iceberg. <laughs> and you know what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, but really, you know, the reason why I wanted to talk about Twitter is... I mean, there's a lot of reasons, but um, the main thing is you know, Twitter is such a critical information sharing tool, especially for information security professionals and journalists and, and a lot of um, different folks around the world. Yeah, I've been it to is a many small... conferences and I've heard over and over and over again when people say, how do you get started? And that InfoSec Twitter, like everyone's like, get on Twitter, follow some people, you learn a lot, you get linked to things, there's a bunch of resources there. It's definitely a, a rich place to to discover and learn and in some cases validate findings, right? It's, it's a really great format for that. And it's really interesting to see just this last month or so of what's been going on, the, the chaos that seems to be happening there. Now, it still functions, right? You can still tweet. You can still follow your, your people. And it's, it's not like it stopped working or anything, but there's definitely like a trend of conversations happening in there about like what's going on at Twitter, not just on Twitter. Yeah, definitely. And the scale of Twitter is actually fairly small compared to the other social media networks. There's only about 230, 40 million active users daily, Mm -hmm. which is minuscule compared to like the 2.9 billion Facebook users and the 1.4 billion Instagram users Mm. Um, but even though it's small, it is definitely mighty. Like it's had a huge influence on culture, journalism, politics, world events. 
it it was the platform that was used to record everything from like the Arab Spring to the ongoing war in Ukraine, and mm-hmm. it's captured our public conversations for years. Mm-hmm. Um, it's only been a couple of weeks since Elon Musk took over Twitter, but since then he's laid off fifty percent of Twitter's seventy five hundred employee workforce, um, and he's also that's a real number. The CEO fifty percent. Yes. I didn't realize it was that high. Yeah. And he also fired the CEO, the CFO, the legal chief, the general counsel. And then in the last two weeks, the people who have left have included, like, the chief customer officer, the chief people and diversity officer, the chief marketing officer, the head of trust and safety, the head of international communications, VP of global client solutions, the chief accounting officer, basically pretty much all of the executives. And this, I don't know if there's an executive left, honestly. And the CISO like just exited like two days ago. Yes. And so that to me was the most concerning because on the same day, it wasn't just the CISO. It was also the chief privacy officer and the chief compliance officer. Oh. And yeah, so it was all three of the people who are essentially responsible to make sure that Twitter is compliant with the FTC's consent decree for security and privacy, Mm -hmm. which is very, very important because if Twitter doesn't follow the FTC's decree, they can get fined. And one example is as part of the decree, Twitter must produce a written uh, privacy review report for each new modified product service or practice that poses a material risk to the privacy, security, confidentiality, or integrity of customers, personal information. Mm. And, they also require Twitter to submit a written report about any data breach affecting more than 250 Twitter users to the FTC within 30 days of its discovery. And part of all of these requirements require like compliance monitoring, third party audits, Mm -hmm. um, mandatory security and privacy programs, which take people to run and people to take responsibility of people familiar with those processes. Yeah. Yeah, they're not just like something you can just say, yeah, we're we're just checking these off. (laughs) Um, And and the fines are no joke. Like the FTC fined Facebook $5 billion in 2019 with a B for violation of their privacy consent decree. So um, there was some reporting to follow this up in The Verge where – they reported Twitter's legal team instructed engineers to self-certify um, the products and services to be in compliance with the FTC order. Um, and like, for example, Twitter blue, uh, which is their subscription service rolled mm-hmm. out a, a whole new model this week. Yeah. And that's that upgrade to their service or change in their service bypassed a lot of the security and privacy checks that were in place at the company. Yeah, that one I I still am puzzled on what what made somebody think it was a good idea to turn that ability to get that blue check that has just kind of naturally presented itself as, you know, this is a person who's been confirmed to be who they claim to be. Right? That check seems to be that indicator, right? Everybody kind of expects that. And now it turns into, well, if you got $8, you can get a check too. And you can make any name you want. You know, you can be any, I I saw a verified Jesus this morning, right? (laughs) So it's just kind of crazy that they, uh, that has just degraded the value of that. And then they introduced some concept of a, a gray check mark that you don't see in the message. You have to go to their profile to see it. And, I don't know. It's it's kind of crazy. Yeah, and what what you're referring to is, you know, for our listeners who may or may not know, is the the verified process was supposed to be in place to prevent people from impersonating a, an official person, right? Mm-hmm. Like you don't want to be able to impersonate the president or um, 
a government agency or something like that. So there's a verified check, which was free before, but now Elon decided to charge $8 for it. Um, and I mean, it's already popping up places that uh, people have warned him that mm-hmm. when it rolled out, it, it you know would, was going to be abused and it certainly was. And, um, you know, you, you talked about uh, impersonating folks like, uh, I saw uh, an impersonation for Tesla. Um, yeah. I saw impersonations for Ted Cruz. Um, several people impersonate Elon himself. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, it can all be funny. There's a lot of funny things about it, right? We can all joke and laugh and and think of it as funny. But what happens if like a government official, like FEMA or like the FBI or something like that, gets impersonated? with this check mark and then they tweet out like a bomb threat or they tweet out like an evacuation something you know mm. um someone impersonated um Eli Lilly and company which is the company that produces insulin and they they jokingly tweeted out that insulin was now going to be free well as a result of that although you know correlation doesn't actually mean causation but mm. take it as you will after that tweet, Eli Lilly and company's stock dropped three point three percent, which huh. is sixteen billion wow. off of their valuation, their market cap. Wow. So, <laughs> um, so with all the automation on stock trading and stuff, you know, if that information is taken in and processed as valid, you know, that that can have a real impact. It's amazing. Yeah. Someone, uh, I just saw that someone impersonated Lockheed Martin and said that they were canceling all defense contracts to Saudi Arabia until, you know, Saudi Arabia reevaluates their human rights record. And, you know, mm-hmm. they, again, someone correlated it to another drop in Lockheed Martin's valuation. Same thing, a couple billion, it was 5% drop in mm-hmm. Lockheed Martin's um, uh, stock price. Mm-hmm. You know, take it as you will. It may not, Again, correlation doesn't mean causation. Right. It could have been the whole market dropped at that point, or you know, the defense sector all in general is is down. But very these unlikely. things do have consequences. It's not very likely that it helped anybody. That's for sure. Right. Exactly. Huh. So, and then there was some interesting reporting around, like the service itself, right? Because if you lay off fifty percent of employees you're not going to have enough staffing to keep up with certain things. Especially um, if there's any kind of movement on uh, the behaviors of the users of the service and needing any kind of maintenance updates or expansions. I mean, supposedly I saw one of the, the messages that it's at a usage is at an all time high, right? Cause people are checking it out trying to see what's going on. Um, so yeah, if you're down staff and you're up on usage, that's not a good combo. And you're trying to roll out new features and, you know, in a pinch like this where you're just kind of shotgunning out changes. Mm -hmm. Um, And what one of the insiders said in this MIT technology review was that, um, you know, you're going to start seeing service degradation, right? And and I think as people have used it this week, they have already seen some some of that. Like follower counts have like gone away or notifications Mm -hmm. aren't, you know, loading correctly um, the Twitter official rules went offline. And so just kind of in general, the, the whole platform is becoming less and less reliable, but mm. it's not like it's going to crash. It's just these little things kind of creep up, right? Little chinks and in the armor. Correct. Mm. Yeah. And, and it's just uh, the bugs will start to creep up and the people who um, used to fix them, they, they've Not all there. left. Like yeah. I, I saw something like some of the people who were, fired um had nine ten eleven years in the company and they had a lot of institutional knowledge tribal knowledge that just kind of walked out the door yeah um, yeah especially if you've got anybody who's got a, a fairly long tenure i mean the the kind of inside understanding of not only the function of things but the reasons uh, that were used to make the decisions to build the things the way they are I mean, those are really important, especially if you get into any kind of crisis mode where there's something that needs to be fixed. You need to know when to cut the blue wire and when to <laughs> cut the red wire. 
Mm. I mean, recently you have been part of some of the engineering teams at Microsoft, right? Mm-hmm. You, you've been in that kind of development cycle. Yeah. Imagine if we had a core critical thing that you're working on and 50% yeah. of your developers and program managers get cut in one yeah. day. It, it's definitely a, 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 a tangible kind of thing. And from my perspective, having, you know, I've been on the engineering team now for little under two years and met and known a lot of people. And just like in any company, there's always staff changes and stuff, but to imagine half of them going away, be substantial, right? And because any one individual has some level of expertise and specialties because of familiarity and time and um, you know, particular interests and things. And if half of those people disappeared, a lot of that would have to be rediscovered, right? Um, in any company, I think of any product and service you're building, there's some amount of rediscovery that would have to go on. So I'm, I'm sure that's where they're at at this point is depending on the the category of employees that they've they've lost. Um, if they're in the development and support stages of the product, there's a lot of people out there that are like holding on to the ropes and they're keeping it going and it can keep going, but they're going to have to sit down for a minute and rediscover how it all works to continue building it. Um, that's, that's a pretty big risk for, um, any new changes they want to bring to the platform, right there. They wouldn't necessarily have a full understanding of the functions to be able to successfully develop that new capability. Um, then that, that would be really tough, especially with the kinds of changes that you see kind of spattered all over the messaging. It's kind of interesting how it feels like he's got these thoughts like Elon, right? He's trying to think of like, there's our methods and approaches we might try, which you usually have conversations with the people, you know, in the room and in your circle. And he's out there in the public, like, just, what do you think? What do you think? And like, man, guy, <laughs> like ideas are cool, but come on, like maybe, you know, formulate it a little bit and then present it in a way, as opposed to just like freaking everybody out. Um, yeah, it's, it's a little concerning to see that kind of behavior, but I don't know that that was super unexpected either, right? It was kind of what people were joking about saying that this is what we're going to see. Personally, I didn't really believe it, right? I thought like, you know, this guy's got a team, he's going to come in and he's going to have a you know a plan and an approach. Um, and I'm sure that's there. Um, but the kind of nature, uh, that he has is just like unprecedented and it's, it's interesting to see how it's playing out. A little ready, fire, aim, right? <laughs> Shooting from the hip a little bit. Um, yeah. so it's definitely chaotic over there and, and hopefully they'll be able to ride out the storm. But there was another article that I read today, which put some, some interesting thoughts in my head, which was more like, what if Twitter collapses, right? Like what if it just mm-hmm. goes bankrupt and goes offline? Um, like, there's a lot of history, human history, recorded on Twitter. And, and you, you may kind of laugh at that, but like th- think about this for a second, okay? The U.S. raid that resulted in Osama bin Laden's death was first announced on Twitter. Initially announced on Twitter? It was initially announced on Twitter. People yeah. right now, in real time, are getting updates on Russia's invasion of Ukraine on Twitter. Mm. The news of the downing of flight MH17, the Malaysian airplane that was likely shot down by pro-Russian forces in Ukraine in 2014, Twitter was where it first surfaced. Mm. Like it is a living, breathing historical document. Mm. Um, I mean, it's, it's been around for 16 years. Yeah. And it's constantly There's, cited in regular broadcast news. Like that's, it's almost like 20% of what you see on the news is taken from Twitter. <laughs> yeah. And, and the amount of information there is massive. So the, the library of Congress actually tried for eight years to maintain a public record of all the tweets, but in 2018 it stopped because it was just too much. The volume was like, <laughs> You know, too much for them to try to store. Not going to store all and that. And all of that is stored on Twitter's private servers. Mm. Right? It's just kind of been an aggregator of all this information. Um, I actually don't so know like much it, about the back infrastructure of Twitter. I'm curious how much of it is their infrastructure versus, like, are they a cloud service uh, subscriber and they are distributed across 
you know, hosting networks, or do they actually run their own data centers? I, I actually don't know. I don't know the answer to that either. I'm sure they use some sort of cloud infrastructure. Wouldn't, but, why wouldn't you? Yeah, but they. I'm sure the the data. You know, it's it's IAS, right? So um, <laughs> it's still it's still their data. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's not like. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, OSINT researchers are concerned about it because of of all of the um, you know, there's there's actually a lot of uh, war crimes documentation of war crimes, you know that is posted on Twitter firsthand. Hmm. Um, they're pulled from like, maybe like telegram channels, but, but they're sharing it on Twitter. Right. Um, and, uh, and like official statements from governments and public services are usually announced on Twitter first. Mm-hmm. So there's this whole historical record that is there. And if it were to go down, like we'd lose all of it. Um, right now I know, you know, just from the chatter, um, that a lot of people are trying to back up their own data. You can archive, you can go and request your own archive of your data. Pull all um, your own tweets. You can. Yeah, exactly. Um, that doesn't do a whole lot for the internet as a whole. Um, <laughs> but you, you can do that. Um, the internet archive, uh, which stores like, um, snapshots of web pages can store snapshots of like Twitter web pages, but it's not like the whole story, right? It's just a snapshot in time. Mm-hmm. Um, so those are like some things that people can do, but it's like just a drop in the pond. Um, mm-hmm. You know, as far as the entire historical document that we have. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, I'm hoping that it continues to function, you know, limp along um that it doesn't <laughs> just like shut down one day um, yeah. and if it does shut down i hope it can be like some sort of controlled shutdown and that we can gather these servers maybe someone will go in and buy the data or something like that for pennies on the dollar yeah it it's weird to think of the possibility uh like i it, i personally still find that hard to believe that a staple of the internet like twitter could disappear like that just doesn't seem right especially like Elon, I don't think would be the kind of person who would buy a thing and just be like, ah, whatever, and then burn it. Um, but there are a lot of changes that he's talking about. Like I've even seen him talking about like long form tweets and like, that's like the whole opposite of what Twitter is. Like Twitter is to give me the summary link to your blog, right? Like I see Twitter threads and I'm like, why are people doing 20 thread posts? Like write a blog. Um, some people just use it different, I guess. But yeah, there's, there's definitely the, Uh, proposal of changes coming to the platform, which you'd expect. Um, I think they're kind of all coming out at the same time with a frenzy of uh, changes that are like most of the stuff that I'd seen coming out on Twitter are around like the HR and um, the employment pieces inside of Twitter, not so much the features and functions. Um, Mm -hmm. So most of what I've seen to come up is just you know, this person uh, quit or (laughs) these people are upset or these people are getting notices that are like a week later on when they left. So yeah, yeah, there's definitely some concern. Um, I'm still using it though. Yeah. I mean, I, I still check in on it, but there are some alternatives that people have been going to recently. Yeah. Um, I have seen some folks actually go back to Tumblr, which is really interesting. Yeah. (laughs) Um, and speaking of Tumblr, it's it's funny because uh, I, I just saw a, a tweet actually um, that said that Yahoo bought Tumblr for like one point three billion dollars or something like that, yeah, and then they is... sold it for three million. Oh, <laughs> you know, really? So they basically lost lost a billion dollars in the whole thing. Hmm. Um, and uh, that's a that's pales in comparison to what Twitter went for, right? Hmm. That was forty four billion. <laughs> forty four billion. <laughs> Yeah, we'll turn around so, and sell that for four million, right, and see what happens. Yeah, yeah. So some people have gone there, but a lot of information security professionals have gone to Mastodon, and so I just wanted I to talk real quick about Mastodon because yeah. we're going to do a whole show breaking down Mastodon. But just real quick, um, a lot of people have gone there, and it may seem a little complicated, uh, but. Once you get used to it, it's it's really not. And in well, fact, the, I think the use of it's pretty similar, right? It's just the underlying way that the message distribution works is fundamentally different. Yeah, there's a cu- there's a couple of differences um, in the fact that it's a, it's a decentralized um, 
social media. So there's not like one overarching person that tells you the rules and everything. So like the um, data that's all of, in Twitter, that's not how it works at Mastodon. There's not a Mastodon data center. That's correct. Right. And, and also, um, you know, there's no ads, there's no telemetry. Um, no, so ads. It, but, <laughs> but the, the, the flow of it, like in a timeline is very similar to, to Twitter. Um, so it's, it, in some ways it's similar, but in a lot of ways it's different. So the, the main thing that I just want to talk about from a 50,000 foot level is that it is decentralized. It's made up of like a federation of servers, hundreds of them. And so when you, when you go and like look up Mastodon and try to sign up for an account, the entry, the barrier to entry for most people is what server should I pick? Mm. And, and once they get overwhelmed with that decision, they usually stop right there. Um, so really what it boils down to is it really, it, it kind of matters, but it also kind of doesn't matter which server you pick. The server you pick, whether it's a large server or small server, will still have the ability to talk to anyone else within the Mastodon Federation. Um, mm. And if you pick a server and you don't like it, you can migrate that entire identity to another server. You can so take you your can, follower account. You, you can, can take create a post. Mastodon account and then move it from one server to the next. Correct. Correct. Mm. You could even, um, if you wanted to, let's say you start on Mastodon.social and then you create a second account on like IOC.exchange, you could alias one account to the other one. Now, if you alias it, it just points it there. Mm-hmm. So you don't necessarily take your followers in your previous post from that account over. But that's a way that if you wanted to keep both accounts, you can alias one to the other and point point them, you know, point the one to the other. Um, or you can migrate completely and you would get rid of, say, your Mastodon uh, social one and migrate everything. And your followers don't even, um, mm-hmm. they don't even know. It's it's seamless to them. They just see you there. So in in... You know, in short, it really doesn't matter. You can pick whatever server you want um, and follow whoever you want within the federation. Um, and uh, yeah, and so um, we're gonna, again. I'm going to do a whole episode on a breakdown of Mastodon, but um, for me, I started using. I, I had a Mastodon account like years ago. Never really yeah. used it. Um, I I made a new one on Infosec. Dot exchange so ajaw zero at infosec dot exchange so you have to for for um for mastodon you want to use your username at server because you need to know what server you're on so usually your full username unlike twitter where it's just like say at ajaw zero mm. um, i'm ajaw zero at infosec dot exchange I so see. A lot of the more of an email address kind people, of thing. correct, correct. Mm-hmm. Very similar to email, right? Like if you create uh, an email at, at gmail dot com, you can communicate to someone who's at outlook dot com, mm-hmm. right? And if you don't like Gmail, you can make an address at outlook dot com and alias it back and forth. Mm-hmm. Kind of similar concept, right? I see. Um, so a lot of the InfoSec people are at InfoSec.Exchange or IOC.Exchange. So those are the two big ones. Um, and so, you know, I encourage you to check it out if you want to get ahead of it. Um, but uh, like I said, we'll do a whole episode on the breakdown of what it is, how to use it, and mm-hmm. kind of some of the rules and culture, which um, in reality, like Macedon was an area where a lot of marginalized communities and folks went to because they were kind of tired of Twitter and other social media, you know, kind of being harassed on those platforms. So they formed their own small communities there. Mm. And this week has almost been like an invasion of their home. We're all <laughs> I kind bet. Of stampeding in and being like, Hey, yeah, we're looking for some refuge. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of different, isms i would say of Mm -hmm. using mastodon so i'm like i said we're going to do a whole episode on it but um, does it have a method that you can go in just like having only looked at it for like 20 seconds two days ago 
does it even have a method you can just like share a link to a Mastodon post and as an unauthenticated user see it? Um, well, that's a good question. I actually shared one in our shared chat. Were you yeah. able to see that? I'll have to look because I, I mean, one of the things that you'll see is you'll have people posting like tweets inside of, uh, <laughs> what's that talking about? We have uh, Alexa talking to me now. Alexa. Uh oh. Oh, I muted it. Alexa, cancel. Oh, wait, we're back. Um, I you look at like news sources, right? And they want to embed posts in their blogs and other media sources, right? So if things start going over towards Mastodon, I wonder if that's even an option. I think it is. Um, in fact, the the link that I sent in our chat, you can bring up as an unauthenticated user. Okay. But that's dependent on the instance, I believe. Oh, so the server because, that you're posting on might have a preference to that. Correct. There is an option. Um, and I know this because I stood up my own Mastodon instance, of course. Mm -hmm, um, look at this guy. But uh, there is an option to... Um, allow or disallow the view of the timeline as an unauthenticated user. Okay. So if that setting is checked, then I believe, you know, it's, it's, it's a server-wide configuration. Okay. Um, so that might be one of the reasons why you choose one or the other is maybe you want them to be public or maybe not. That's interesting. Correct. Correct. So... But anyways, that's that's uh, all I had for this week. Um, I just had a lot of thoughts on this whole Twitter thing <laughs> drama going on. And um, I, I'm heavily emotionally and professionally invested in Twitter mm -hmm. because it has played a big part in, um, like you said, a lot of InfoSec people learn mm -hmm. from Twitter. They, they follow folks. They, they get validated in, in some of the ideas or configurations or whatever you're doing, um, asking for help, mentoring, all of that stuff. Um, and I think it's a great tool. Um, I, I definitely felt a little bit of loss this week as this, this whole migration was happening. But, you know, the caveat is, is that uh, I, I think I have found a nice community in Mastodon where a lot of the InfoSec people have gone to. So um, we'll do another show on that. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out. I mean, Twitter is one of those social media platforms that I, I do use and most of the others I'm not involved in at all. I mean, I, I still get my LinkedIn messages, but that's pretty niche. It's, it's all work. Right. And Twitter is mostly work because I follow a lot of uh, InfoSec and, um, infrastructure and endpoint management and Azure and Azure AD and all that kind of stuff that's kind of work related. But then there's all the other things like home assistant and home automation and all the other kinds of interesting um, niche things that people like to post. Like I just posted a new YouTube video or things that are out there. Like if that stuff started going away, I mean, it wouldn't exactly be the end of the world, but it's definitely going to change the way I spend time on my phone <laughs> for good or bad. Definitely. Maybe. Right. I guess we'll see. Yeah, exactly. And that's our show for this week. Shannon, thanks for sitting in for Adam. Much appreciated. Yeah. You bet. Uh, if you guys have any questions, uh, our contact information will be in the show notes. Thanks and talk. We'll talk to you guys next week. Take care. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJAW0 and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.